Hi everyone, uh, my name's Matt Johns. I'm going to give a quick talk on basically a journey Sky UK has gone through in the last couple of years. We've kind of gone from robust to resilient um, and hopefully to improve our availability um, of a video play out. So who am I? Uh, I'm a solution architect at the Sky. I'm responsible for something called the online video platform, OVP. Um, I'm a developer. I'm still a coder at heart. I just don't get the, the opportunities anymore, really. Um, uh, spare time technical author, not that I have much more spare time. Um, it's available on Amazon if you like. Um, so what is online video platform? Basically, when you're playing out one of the sort of Sky branded and Now TV applications, there's a couple of things you actually need to be able to consume our content. Basically, a content URL um, and digital rights. All our content's quite premium, so it's all protected and there's that process we need to go through. On top of all of that, sort of the basics you need, there's also a whole bunch of business rules we have to apply upon you. These are things like device registration, geolocation, you have to be in a certain country. And we've got these business rules that we enforce within that process as well. Now, we've got all this great content and you want to be able to watch it. So we've gone through a process of making sure it's as highly available as possible. You want to hit play and you want it to work. So we've made sure that it is active active deployed in multiple locations so it's always there for you but we've also put in a lot of resiliency into the system things can break and hopefully you don't really notice but it's been a bit of a journey to get here Sky's actually been doing subscription online video for really rather a long time we started way back in 2005 with a product called Sky by Broadband um, later shortly after this we actually launched another product called Sky Mobile TV but if you think back to 2005 our smartphones weren't very smart, and they definitely were pre-iPhone. A couple of years later, big leap forward, we rebranded it, called it Sky Player at this point, and started to expand on a number of different devices, initially on Xbox 360. But the big change came in 2011. We massively expanded the content lineup, introduced a whole bunch of live channels, and critically launched on iOS under what I'm sure you hopefully all are aware of, the iconic Sky Go brand. But all of this ran on a single platform. It's one that evolved over a number of years, but it had a number of constraints that were starting to kind of get in the way of those core principles of getting customers to content. It was a monolith. Um, great in some ways, a bit arcane in terms of its architecture, but it came up with a lot of problems. It meant that any time you changed anything, it was a big thing. So you kind of didn't do that very often. Um, we also had, unfortunately, sticky sessions. Again, something from, from, a, from a day. Um, and so it meant that every time we did a release, there was a peripheral effect to customers. So you, stun, you started to shift your release uh, windows into the middle of the night. That's not great for developers. So again, you don't do it very often. So all of these things are stopping you adding value, stopping you adding new features. and preventing you actually adding better capabilities and better resilience to customers. The legacy platform was also um, a traditional active passive DR setup. Um, as great as these are, they're very expensive to run. And also, when you actually need them, as much as you can drill using them, you can never invoke them as fast as you need them. So we started to look where things needed to go. By this point, Online video was definitely on the up. It was definitely shifting into a product in its own right. And we needed to build a new platform for the future. So we had this legacy platform. It was supporting all live play out. We wanted to start to pick away at it, break down that monolith, split out all the various features it was actually doing, and start to bring them into their own spaces. We took a big chunk out really early on. Um, one of the big areas within that monolith was our device management concur uh, concurrency tracking systems. It generated quite a lot of load within that platform. So by getting it out, we can free up space within that monolith. The idea there was we'd pick away at sort of features within that monolith, reintegrate them back in, and kind of skinny it down over time. Um, hopefully, by the point it becomes so skinny, it would be really easy to replace. The problem we found during that was actually we spent as much time and effort reintegrating that new feature back into the old monolith than we did actually building it. So we kind of started, why are we spending so much wasted effort here? We kind of want to move forward, not kind of crowbar the new world back into the old. So we started more towards a side-by-side -side replacement. We still had to keep the, assist the, the live system running, but we'd kind of identify what was important about it, what was that common state 
that we needed to share between both worlds. That way, we could build a whole new system that ran alongside it. The common state could be shared between them, and the new clients could move across as and when they were ready. So we moved into the wonderful world of microservices. Now, this was quite a long time ago. This as a term really was sort of in its infancy, more of an SOA light than it was microservices back then. Um, but this was the strategy we were moving towards. We kind of ended up with two types of microservice within our domain. What I've kind of dubbed as a feature microservice. Beyond the hype, microservices are great for promoting good context separation, but you kind of want to make sure you do one thing, or at least a couple of related things, but do them really well. That way, the team that manages it can really understand what it is they're trying to solve and can understand the problem they are involved in in the bigger picture. So we end up with this ca capability of feature services. These tended to be stateful, depends on the domain. So some were the, like the device management system, some were the VOD metadata system. All of these needed a bit of database, but by having them operate as own units, you can make them figure out how was best for them to support that kind of use case. We ended up with a sort of a relatively generic stack to start with. Um, this was basically prior to a lot of these, these frameworks appearing. We started off with a Jersey, Jackson, glued together with Juice framework. That actually ended up morphing into, I'm sure some of you have come across it, Drop Wizard. Um, so we've kind of moved towards that because why write and glue all that stuff together when someone's done all the hard work for you? Um, in later days, we found as the performance has gone up, the need to scale has gone up, we've moved towards much more towards NIO. So Rat Pack is one of our big uh, libraries of choice at the moment, along with a bit of Acker um, and some, some really high concurrency systems. We've actually gone to raw Scala as well. Another type of service we need to kind of bring this all together is whilst you've got all these individual features, they're not a product in their own right. You kind of need to glue them together to kind of create a real end-to-end -end journey. So you end up with a second type of service, a gateway service. These are pretty much stateless. They don't really do much in themselves other than they get a request in, they make a bunch of requests to exercise a business journey and return a response. But for those feature services, they need state. So we wanted to make sure that when we were re-engineering our platform, we could grow, we could grow that state. Our legacy platform was using a popular sort of enterprise-y relational database. We didn't want to go down that route. We wanted to make sure we could grow. So big must-haves. We want to be able to shard our data, fragment it around, so that we can scale up, ideally with a linear scaling pattern. As we need more, we can just add more. We haven't got some kind of exponential growth that's going to bite us sometime down the line. We want to make sure that even though we're partitioning our data, we don't, we're not going to get a loss of service if one server dies. We need to make sure we're always there. Um, and because of our sort of previous experience, I'm sure a lot of your experience with DR, we needed to make sure we had an efficient multi-data center capability. This would be our fundamental ability to go active-active. So we ended up with a bit of a cookie-cutter pattern. Um, we, we kind of really fell in love with Apache Cassandra. Um, it's a great technology. The only thing I would say is it takes an awful long time to get all those tuning settings right to actually make it hum. Um, beyond that, we've really moved now into uh, Apache Ka Kafka as well. Um, that's not Apache Kafka, just Kafka. Um, mainly to sort of a lot of our asynchronous workflows, and it's great for that. And a couple of our individual feature services also needed in-memory capabilities. So we have a bit of Hazelcast and more, more late, uh, recently Redis thrown into the mix as well. So this is generally what our new platform looks like. I hasten to add it's slightly more complicated than that, but this is the, tent, the general flavor. We have a bunch of sort of gateway services that front closest to the customer, mostly stateless, and a bunch of feature services generally behind. It, there's a bit of a mix in the, in the middle. We kind of broadly got about 10 to teens of my, uh, features, about five or so gateways. But it's not really just that. As I mentioned, we wanted to go active-active. So in reality, we threw all of this behind a global load balancer. And the reason we did that, because actually, it's running in multiple locations. We're using this CDN-provided global load balancer to route traffic to our two different sites. That way, if one site dies, brilliant. Our CDN can identify that and route the traffic to the system that's still up. But what really underpins this is your data. 
you can make your services not dependent upon other remote data centers, but your data that sits underneath it kind of needs to be shared. So you really need to understand how your data is going to flow around your system and how your customers are going to interact with that data and how your system will interact with that data. Basically, what it really boils down to, how tolerant are you to eventual consistency? In order to have a sort of a reliable multi-data center system, you can't be sort of synchronously dependent upon that replication. You've got to cope with it being a bit slow. And it really also boils down to how fast are you going to read your own writes? If you're changing something, are you going to read it quickly? If you are, there's a couple of things you can do, both of which are, have their own I issues. We talked previously about sticky sessions. You can start to do sticky data centers. This isn't the same problem as we had before. You don't need to talk to a particular data center, but if you're going to read your own data quite quickly, it's probably better you did because it's more likely to be consistent. The important thing there is if you need to cut over the customer to the other one, you can do so at any time. It's just best they kind of stuck there if you did. The other thing you can look at is your clients talking to both sides. Can you give a bit of data back to the client that can kind of basically bring its own state back to the platform? This could be as simple as a bit of cookie data that you can use to know about a bit, bit more about that client and that device. So one thing we need to be aware of when you come to microservices, beyond the hype, they're not actually as reliable or as available as a monolith. A monolith is one thing, it's self-contained, it has less things to go wrong. So if you can make that stay up, your, prop your service is pretty good. You need to make sure that because you've got these multiple groups of microservices, now if you're depending upon three things rather than one thing, you're, even if all of them say they're 99% available, actually when you times that all together, it's really only 97. So in order to try and bring our availability targets and our resiliency targets back up, you need to be resilient to something when it goes wrong. So you can start to carve out some of those 99s out of that equation. And the main problem we've got, especially when it comes to video, is it's an onslaught. Customers are hitting play all the time. You cannot adapt fast enough. If you were to monitor it, get alerts, have a human receive that alert, decide what action to take, it's like minutes down the line, customers are starting to get annoyed. You need to kind of basically automate your solution. So to do this, we kind of need to look at what are we calling. When, our, when we're calling our multiple services that actually support our playout, you'll broadly find your dependencies will fall into one of these three categories. Something that's technically required, you won't cope without it. You kind of, it's massively dependent. Think like your VOD metadata. If you don't know what URL you need to return for the content, you, you're pretty much done. You've then got the middle ground, things that we're supposed to do. These are the things that business rule says, I must make sure you only use two devices. Well, that's a middle ground. It's important, but if I didn't do it, you'd still see stuff on the screen. Finally, there's the bit at the bottom, operationally required. These are the kind of nice to haves. My system works best if I can do this, but I can kind of probably ignore it and actually nothing's gonna happen. So by assessing those different requirements, those different dependencies you have, start to formulate an automated strategy for how you'd cope if it wasn't there. How best to react and adapt kind of really depends upon what one of those three categories you fall in and how it might affect you and your business. Some people will take more uh, pragmatic approaches, some will be, have to be quite strict. Ultimately that really comes down to your requirements rather than mine. Make sure you time bound whatever you're doing. At a highest level, this is a timeout. If you're calling a network service, make sure you say, if I don't get a response within X amount of time, it's as bad as a failure. But then, okay, if that happens, treat it like you would have had a failure and invoke your strategy either way. One of the big things to watch out for is don't try and internally retry. You're actually creating, you're creating a load within your own platform. If something fails, don't try and cover it up Decide, define, define your system how it copes in spite of that issue. The best thing there is actually, if you also have a strategy of if it starts to fail and it fails a lot, stop calling it for most of your traffic. The funny thing is your system gets a lot faster if you do a lot less. So normally that gives a bit of breathing space to whatever it is that's failed to allow it to recover. And the last one is from a customer point of view, fail in favor of them. A degraded success to them is far better than a failure. As I mentioned, your ability to degrade will really depend upon the use case. 
So the best strategy is to just do that if you can. You don't need any state. You can just have a strategy of, if I can't get this, this is what I do in a relatively naive way. But if you can't do that, what else could I do? One of the strategies we've adopted is something called a last known good. It's basically, if I'm calling a dependency now, I might call it again in the future for this same interaction, for this same customer, for this same device, for this same content. Maybe I can squirrel away the data I'm getting back now, because if I don't get it later, I could probably use this as a bit of a stand-in. Now, ultimately, you can't do this for everything. There's a lot of data flying around the system. So you kind of need to prioritize, size it accordingly, make sure your popular content, your, your customers that use you the most are keeping the system warm by their actions. It's not really a performance cache. We're not using this to make it go faster. We're always trying the right thing first. But in lieu of a, a failure, I'd rather fail to something than nothing. So why is this important? So this is actually a response time from our main video playout API from a, a day last year. I'm going to take a wild guess. You can probably see what I'm about to talk about. Um, so everything was humming along, humming along quite nicely until, well, there. Um, alarms went off, but nothing actually went wrong. Customers were playing out OK. So this is actually what went wrong. This is the culprit. Um, this is actually one of the dependencies behind that playout gateway service. Um, as you can imagine, all the alarms on that dependency went off. Um, I've got, actually got, you can see a number of the percentiles, it went from pretty healthy to really not healthy at all very, very quickly. Um, the great news in this case was it was actually one of those operational dependencies I talked about earlier. We can actually cope without this thing being there. So we've coded for that. So actually, the teams got all the alarms, got all the alerts, saw what was going on. They escalated to the team responsible for this dependency and pretty much then just kept an eye on it. Because actually, from a customer's perspective, everything was working. All content was still playing out. The system has kind of reacted and coded around the problem to keep videos playing. So what have we done next? Well, because we're now active-active, because we're now in a scenario where each system is a lot smaller, and therefore the team understands it a lot more, we can change things way more frequently. So we started to go down a big push towards continuous delivery. We've got a lot of automated pipelines now that when you make a commit, it's flowing through a whole bunch of automated quality gates. We're almost getting to the point of getting to the next stage of continuous deployment and actually going, hang on, assuming it passes everything, let's ship it to customers. There's obviously a whole bunch of other things we need to make sure we do in that process. Uh, Canary is one of those big ones. Trial, trial is out in customers. But really make sure you're happy that it's going to go live before you actually get, make it go live. One of the big things I would have done differently if we'd have uh, seen, it, seen the way things had gone in microservices early on is invest in common tooling. We've actually gone quite broad in the number of services, and teams have gone away and solved a lot of the same problems over and over again. So we've got a lot of scripts that do a lot of the same thing. So we've gone through an exercise to try and consolidate it down so that teams, people can move between teams and actually the same processes work the same between different teams. The other one is deployment. How do we ship and actually manage our code when we sh to actually put it live to customers? We've had a big drive towards con uh, containerization um, and also using things like Kubernetes to manage that. Um, it definitely creates a great boundary between effectively developers and actually shipping that's a lot closer to developers. We've gone more active-active, so we've actually now in multiple cloud installations and an on-prem all live right now. So you're actually being served by multiple data centers when you play on SkyGo Now TV. The other thing is observe. Um, by capturing all these metrics, you saw our graphs earlier, you can learn a lot more about how your system works, how customers interact with your service, and refine, add more metrics add more resiliency strategies if that a particular dependency shifts the way it performs. Observe, react, and adjust. And, alert, and alerting. Make sure that anything that can move, and it moves beyond your acceptable boundaries, make sure someone knows about it. So the big takeaways that we've gone through on this journey is really understanding how data flows around your system, how people use your system. Make sure your services are robust. This is the bread and butter stuff. You can make microservices resilient. Make sure they isolate themselves and they're robust in each data center. But also, if they're calling other systems, make sure they're resilient. They don't expect that system to always have to be there. 
because if they ca it can't be there, they can't really do anything about that. They've got to react with the, the, the interactions they've got right now. So degrade if you can. And if you can't degrade, consider stashing some last known good data from this interaction close to you under your control. So hopefully, either the dependency you're calling or your own database is available, because if both are down, you're really, really screwed. And lastly, again, monitor and alert. Have emergency options so you can adjust and react to the system, but at the same time, never assume you have to use it. Your system will react way faster than you ever could, but at the same time, you never know where, where, the, where things are going to go a bit weird that you've never seen before. So if you like anything that uh, I've said today, we've actually got a, a website, developers.sky.com, and have a look. <laughs>